Lord, thank you that you are a prayer answering God and that you are a covenant keeping God. Would you now speak life to us as we examine your word? Pray now, God, it has already been prayed you would heal and deliver according to your word, that you would save for your name's sake. Bless the person I'm touching right now. See about every situation in their life. Today, God, whoever does not know you, draw them to you. Whoever may be struggling with their faith, give them confidence. Whoever may be dealing with sickness or financial struggle, or whatever may be just vexing their spirit, I pray a healing and a deliverance in this space. Bless those online on our East City campus. Give us now, God, information, inspiration, and implementation. Speak, Lord. We're listening in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, y'all. Let's make our affirmation before the Lord, and then I want to read into your hearing at 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9. But come on, let's make our affirmation together. I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. I'm ready to receive the word of God. I take authority over every hindrance. I set myself in agreement with God's plan for my life. And when I leave this place, I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, I know that's right. Listen, um, 2 Samuel chapter 9, before I start reading, I want to put a pastor's voice on what Malcolm shared. Um, we woke up this morning, y'all, and when we woke up this morning, we discovered that time went back one hour. If we don't vote, we're going to wake up on Wednesday morning. And we will have discovered that time went back 50 years. And if you think it's rough now, you ain't seen nothing. And so I, I cannot urge you enough that you got to vote. Um, many of us fought in the General Assembly so that people with a felony sentence that, was, that were not in jail, so they could be out still serving probation, they could be on post-release supervision, they could be on, pay, on, on parole. If you have a felony, but you are not in jail, you can vote in North Carolina. You can vote in North Carolina. And so, and if you if you nervous, this not look this not Florida, okay? And so, if you scared, if you nervous, you call me. I'll come vote with you. But you can vote in North Carolina. And I'm gonna say one more thing, my young people. Let me tell you something. Nobody's expecting y'all to vote. Your vote alone changes the next 30 years of your life. The vote right now. So 18 to 30 year olds in North Carolina, your vote is under 7% right now. Now all y'all, uh, they your children. And grandchildren and great grandchildren. Right, and so I, I just wanna emphasize this y'all. We gotta get to the polls on Tuesday. And so, um, Tell your neighbor, send somebody to the polls Tuesday. Does that... So we got to use our influence. And I'm sorry I'm taking a moment with this, but it needs to be said. We have to use our influence. So if you've gone to the polls already, call or text 10 people. Ask them if they voted. You know, just talk to them about it. See what they need. If you need a ride to the polls, William Tony Funeral Home, covering Zebulon and Spring Hope, H.D. Pope Funeral Home, um, uh, Hunter Odom Funeral Home, and Matthew's Funeral Home 
have all committed to having their fleet of vehicles available to drive you to the polls on Tuesday. All you have to do is call the church. We'll dispatch a limo to take you to the polls. So, so we need to vote, y'all. Come on, say amen if you can. All right. 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to go ahead and preach now. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Scriptures, and we find these words. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, where is he? Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? And then King called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, all that belongs to Saul and all to his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Meshivopheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Before you take your seat, look at somebody. Look at somebody. Tell them, neighbor, God is making room, God is making room at, some at some tables. Hallelujah. You can have your seat. Tell your other neighbor, God is making room at some tables. I Somebody already got the revelation. God is about to shock some folk with who he lets at the table. I'm trying to encourage somebody already. All those folk that's been blocking you, God is making room at the table. All those folk that didn't want you sitting with them, God is making room at the table. All those folk that counted you out and said you would never become anything, they better get ready. Tell your neighbor, make some room, make some room, make some room, because God is making room at some tables. Oh, God. It's going to be some folk looking up wondering, how you get here? You, that, you, you, you missed the text. The same folk that you used to serve going to start serving you. And it's going to be a generational blessing.
because he had a son who got blessed right alongside. Can I go ahead and speak that over the room before I unpack this text? May God bless us with a generational blessing and may we curse every generational curse in the name of the Lord Jesus and may God raise up prosperity and wisdom and opportunity on behalf of my child. Ooh, God. Let me, let, me, let me preach this text. Let me preach this text. Ah. I sense a release, y'all. Some of us have been waiting. We've been pleading. We've been wondering. We've been crying. We've been giving. We've been sacrificing. We've been fasting. And God is saying, don't worry. I see you, and I'm about to make room for you. Oh, God. Today, I'm just trying to encourage the house. I just want to encourage the house, Mike. Folk that feel like I'm not in a good place. Folk that feel like I'm in less than an ideal situation. Folk that feel like I'm not getting to a better place. I'm here to encourage somebody to just hold on. That there is a blessing that is about to be released from the Lord. A blessing that's been thought by God. A blessing that's been bought by Jesus. A blessing that's been wrought by the Holy Spirit. A blessing that's being fought by Satan, but a blessing that's being caught by me. Oh, God. David, y'all just have a seat. I'm, let me, just give me a minute with the text. I, David is at the zenith of his career. David is living high, Dwight, as the king of Israel. David has moved from victory to victory. David in this text is at the apex of his life. And finally, he is ruling an entire united kingdom. It's a united kingdom that has, that has grown from 6,000 square miles to 60,000 square miles. David, never known a political defeat. David, never known a military defeat. David, now leading on the throne with, with inflation low, with the economy high. David leading at an all-time high where his public approval rating is higher than it's ever been. Uh, it's good in the land. Every house has a chariot. There's a chicken in every pot. There's grapes on everybody's vine. There's rivers of peace and prosperity literally flooding the land. And all of the excitement that has historically characterized the life of David is different now. For the first time, no wars. For the first time, there, there's no battles. For the first time, stay close, I'm going somewhere. There's no political intrigue. Uh, for the first time, there is peace. For the first time, the kingdom has advanced for the first time uh, his enemies are being subdued for the first time the kingdom has prospered and yet everything was at rest with David except his heart I don't know who I'm preaching to but sometimes everything around you can be at peace but there's something still swirling in your belly and in your gut that God won't let you let go of. He's unfought all the battles. All the wars have been won. The kingdom has been established. And yet, I can't help but to think about the person that might have less than me. I got to preach this. I, see, some folk can't be trusted with success because God does not trust that when you get it, you're going to spend a moment to see who you can use your influence to help rescue and make give them a better life. 
he's got this thing swirling, y'all, and Shoshana, this thing makes me want to run around this room. Here's the question, Ron. Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul? Let me tell you why this should make you shout. The question David raises, is there anyone left of the house of Saul? Don't, don't miss where I'm going. He does not say, is there anyone qualified left? Yeah. He doesn't say, is there anybody worthy left? Is there anybody deserving left? Is there anybody who earns it joiner left? Is there anybody left that I can do something for, that can do something for me in return? He says, I just want to know, is there anybody left? Can I go ahead and bless you? When God opens a door for us and sits us at the table, it's not because we earned it. It's not because we deserved it. It's not because I got a degree to help me with it. It was strictly as a result of the unmerited, oh Jesus, the unmerited grace and favor of God. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but were it not for the grace of God, we would not be where we are. Were it not for God looking over my life and saying, you don't deserve it, but I'm still doing it anyway way he says is there anybody left I can show some grace to I'm gonna move on and give you this point real quick y'all but y'all I don't know when the last time you've done it but if you haven't done it lately you better give God praise for grace see grace is unmerited favor Grace is unwarranted favor. Grace is undeserved kindness. Okay, let me JDG it. Yo, grace is I know all about you, but I'm going to still do it for you anyway. Grace is I know where the bury, I know where the bodies are buried. I know where the secrets are. I know what you've been thinking about. I know the attitude of your heart, and I don't care about none of that. I, I know... I heard the prayers of your friends that asked me not to do it. I heard the, friend, the prayers of some folk that didn't want me to open up a door. But the reason why I did it is because I only let three folk vote on your life. Me, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And so you ain't never got to worry about appeasing people because at the end of the day, they don't have a vote. Tell your neighbor, you don't have a vote on my favor. You, you don't have a vote on the door God will open. You don't have a vote on whether or not God will move in my life. So there's going to be some folk that you're going to sit at the table next to that voted for you not to be there. God is making room at some tables. <laughs> And let me tell you, Tristan, he's making room at some tables. Number one, Joy, despite my faults. I'm here to open up a blessing for somebody. If you're in this room today, if you're on the East City campus and you are aware of your faults, you are aware of your issues. You are aware of your circumstances. You are aware of your case. You are aware of some, literally the name Mephibosheth literally means shameful thing. He's been named shameful thing. And here he is with a condition that medicine can't cure. Where's his fault? His fault is his family. Uh -oh. Verse 3 says, Beach, he's of the house of Saul. Everybody say the house of Saul. Pastor, why is that a big deal? Because the house of Saul was a mortal enemy of the house of David. Which means everyone that was in the house of Saul, it was really the objective of David to make sure none of them lived. Yo, by rights, Mephibosheth should never have an opportunity just because he was born in the wrong family. I'm about to set the room free. And we still live in a society that because your name 
is not Kennedy, Obama, because your name is not Bush or Cooper. That folk think no good thing can come out of you. But that's exactly the reason why we have to be born again. Because the moment we are born again, I get adopted into a new family. And the new family I get adopted into is a family of royalty. A family where the father of the family owns a cattle on a thousand hills. A family where the father of the family has all knowledge and all power and all wisdom. So you got to be careful how you treat saved folk because you don't know who their daddy is. See, Mephibosheth is born, Mel, on the wrong side of the tracks. He is a sinner by nature, just as we are sinners by choice and by nature. It's because we are born into the wrong family that I need a new birth into the right family, which is why in a moment, you're gonna have an opportunity to get saved because you need birthing in a better family. Doesn't mean your family is jacked up, but it does mean you got sin in your family. It does mean you got generational issues in the family. And the moment we are born again, we are born into a new family. His place that he is living is a place called Lodabar. Literally, Lodabar means a place of no pasture. It's a barren place. I think so many people, as I preach today, in this campus, on the East City campus, so many of us, we, we, we are just lacking something on the inside. David says, I'm going to bless you despite your faults. Can, I'm moving on, but can I just go ahead and drop this little nugget? See, we have to stop being angry and jealous and envious of God opening doors for people that we happen to know about their past. Because can I help y'all? I'm preaching to a room full of people in a whole East e City campus that all of us have a past. And at the end of the day, the blessing of salvation is joining God gets to bless me and puts me at the table in spite of my faults. It's, it's folk in the room with ugly backgrounds. Am I the only one in church today that's messed up a time or two? Come on, come on, be honest, y'all. Am I the only one? that's done some stuff, minister B, that wasn't real right, it was real jacked up, and thanks be to God, he still allows me to be placed at the table. Whew. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move on. Let me, hurry, let me hurry up. God is going to prepare a table before you despite your faults. But join her, not just a seat at the table despite your faults, but a seat at the table despite your falls. See, 2 Samuel chapter 4 tells us what happened to Mephibosheth. 2 Samuel chapter 4 says somewhere along the lines of Jonathan's son Saul had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old. When the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, his nurse took him up and fled, this is scriptures. And it happened as she made haste to flee, Second Samuel chapter four, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. So, ooh, I wanna to minister to somebody. Sometimes folk are like they are at no fault of their own. We better stop asking folk what's wrong with you and start learning how to ask them what happened to you. 
Because sometimes all that nasty, I'm preaching better than y'all giving me credit. All that, all that judging folk about their attitude and their disposition. You don't know how you would be had the same thing happen to you. You don't know it. I don't know why she can't speak to nobody. Why don't you ask her what happened to her? It may be a joker that looked just like you. That every time she see you, she thinking about who dropped her. I want to go ahead and minister to somebody, somebody that's been dropped by somebody else. God has a table for you. Somebody that's been abused by somebody else. God has a table for you. Somebody that's been betrayed by somebody else. God has a table for you. Don't give up. Don't quit. God is not done using you. And in spite of what happened to you, God's got a plan for you. Oh, God. You... Y'all, he gets dropped as a child and winds up lame. He is lame because of a fall. Y'all think you're not in the text? All of us in this room have had a bout of lameness. Because in the original fall of Adam in the garden, that fall made all of us lame. But thanks be to God that when God goes looking for those he's going to rescue and the doors he's going to open for people, he recognizes that despite people's falls, I'm going to prepare a table before them. Because Mephibosheth chef was crippled, it's going to, God, it's so good if y'all can get this in y'all spirit. Watch it, MIT. Let me just unpack the text real fast. Because he was crippled, he couldn't come to David. Because we were crippled, we couldn't come to Jesus. I know some of y'all think I'm saved because I walked down an aisle. No, let me tell you something. He placed by his Holy Spirit a desire for him inside of you. And when I wasn't thinking about him, he had me on his mind. And I was too crippled to come to church. I was too crippled to pray for myself. But thanks be to God, when I wasn't coming to him, he was coming to me. Oh, God. Is there anybody in church grateful that God came to you? When I was lost in sin, he rescued me. Come, come, prodigal son, testify. When I came to myself, while I was still a great way off, my daddy who was sitting on the front porch saw me in a distance. And while I was finally getting myself together, my daddy started running to me. And he got to me quicker than I could get to him. I don't know who... I'm grateful for God running after me. All that stuff talking about, I'm running after God, I'm running after God. No, God been running after you. Woo, good. I want you to get that image in a minute. When you start typing it online, I want to be saved. When you start walking down the aisle, I know your image is you're going to be you taking a few steps. But this is what I want you to get in your spirit. While you taking a step, the Lord is running after you. He, you, you for every step you take, he gonna, he's going to... Goodness and mercy. Psalm 23. It's not in the Hebrew shall follow me. Because following means walking behind me. And, no, no. You can follow somebody and never get them. It does not say in the Hebrew, goodness and mercy shall follow me. It says in the Hebrew, goodness and mercy shall pursue me. When a cop is following you, that's different than when a cop is pursuing you. And the reason I'm saved and you're saved is because God was pursuing you and made up in his mind that you were so valuable and so significant and so special, he was going to grab a hold of you. God is preparing a table in spite, tell your neighbor, despite your faults. Tell your neighbor, despite your falls. I'm going to give y'all something to shout about if y'all catch it. Here's the third point. I'm done. He's preparing a table not just despite your faults, 
and not just despite your falls, but he's preparing a table despite my forecast. (sighs) It's one thing to be crippled with a future. It's an entire different story to be crippled with no forecast that you'll ever get better. Y'all, I'm here to tell you, God does not care that man has counted you out. Because he knows every person that has counted you out can't count. He knows that every person who said what you would not be does not know the plans. I feel this in my Holy Spirit. The plans that he tells your neighbor, he's got plans for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Plans to excel you. Plans to graduate you. Plans to motivate you. Plans to heal you. It does not matter what the forecast is. God has a great plan for you. And here it is. He's doing it not for your sake. I'm about to run around this room. Y'all, don't don't get in my way in a second, y'all. He says, I'm going to do it for Jonathan's sake. Because that was his best friend. And it breaks his heart that there's somebody from Jonathan's family, from the house of Saul, that still is not blessed. God, I'm here, the Holy Ghost. He says, Jonathan's dead. But his favor over you still lives. Can I preach to somebody? Your mother, grandmother, she may not be with you right now, but God gonna open the door for their sake. Because they were praying for you. For they, oh God. We owe God a praise, y'all, for looking out for us based upon his commitment to somebody else. Can I tell you what keeps me going? My mama may not be with me physically, but she still got some prayers up there that the Lord need to answer. And one day he'll open up a door and it won't be because I'm the pastor of Word Tabernacle. It won't be because I have a master's in divinity. It won't be because I have a master's in sacred theology. He gonna look at me and say, for Ruth's sake. Look at your neighbor and tell them the name of your mother or father and say, for their sake. He gonna do it for mama's sake. He gonna do it for daddy's sake. I wish I had folk in church that could praise God for opening up a door when I didn't deserve it, when I didn't wasn't worthy. He did it for my sake. Oh God, I'm out of time, y'all. You, y'all, 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 y'all missing this. For Martin's sake, you get the vote. Y'all, y'all ain't talking to me. You ain't never done nothing to earn a right to vote. You ain't marched nowhere. You ain't died nowhere. He giving you that right for Martin's sake. He giving you that right for somebody else. Didn't none of us do nothing to not be born a slave. But I'm not for Frederick Douglass sake. Y'all, for God will bless you for somebody else's sake. I'm I'm done. Ryan, you got something on there that sounds like a dinner bell. I don't know. Anything that sounds like a dinner bell? It it can, it's, 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 it's dinner time at David's house. And, and David has all these servants. That's, that's, that's preparing to serve a meal. David rings, the servant rings the dinner bell. David walks out to the table, sits down 
at the head of the table. Servant rings the dinner bell again. Tamar, looking all fine, walks out, sits down next to David. They ring the dinner bell again. The heir apparent, his wise son Solomon, walks out with all of his wisdom, sits down next to his daddy. They ring the dinner bell again. In walks Absalom, his other baby boy, with all of his strength and courage and all of his muscles, and he sits down at the table. They ring the dinner bell again. Joab gets invited to dinner that particular Sunday night. He's the one that's been keeping, keeping the battlefield right. And then the dinner bell gets rang one more time. This time, they, they, they hear feet shuffling. They hear crutches. And everybody looks up. And they pull the table up for my feeble chef. But when they pull the table up, for my feeble chef, he sits his crutches down. And they pull the curtain, the tablecloth over his feet. And sitting at the table, you can't tell the difference between the lame person and the unlame. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but God will cover you in such a way that folk won't even be able to see what you used to be. Tell your neighbor, I don't look like what I've been through. Tell your neighbor, God has covered me. He's covered every pain. He's covered every sin. He's covered every blemish. By his stripes, I'm healed. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day, I was lost. He died on the cross. Tell your neighbor I've been covered. I... Come on, get two people a high five. Tell them I've been covered. I... See, when you've been covered. You don't know the difference. You can sit at the table like this. You can sit at the table like this. Or you could be all messed up with no legs at all. And it does not matter. Tell your neighbor, because I've been covered. This is a good place just to, just to offer the Lord a moment of worship right now. Come on, lift your voice, lift your voice, lift your voice. Come on, I said lift your voice. It's all right to clap your hands, but lift your voice. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I praise you, Lord. Thank you for letting me at the table, God. Thank you for making room for me. Come on, tell him thank you, God, for making room for me, thank you for sitting me at the table, thank you. Oh God, God make room for your people. Board tables, business tables, political tables, tables of blessing, God. Sit us at the table, God. 
I come against any spirit of embarrassment or shame. You belong at the table. Oh God. 